Welcome to episode 24, The Truth About Tariffs. Before we get started, I always like to ask for you to consider sharing the show with your friends. If you are having a discussion on Facebook or Twitter about the recent election, birthright citizenship, Thanksgiving, Jesus Christ, what to do with the federal government's ever-expanding role in our lives, or tariffs, please share the episode with your friends. Also, if you are listening on Apple Podcast app, please take a moment to scroll down and give the podcast a five-star rating. Also, please consider supporting the show financially. All donations will be used to expand the reach of the show. See the show notes page at truthquest.podbean.com for the link to the support page. The easiest way to stay up to date on the podcast is to subscribe to it on iTunes or Google Play Music. It's also available on Stitcher, Spotify, or Podbean. Google Play Music. It's also available on Stitcher, Spotify, or Podbean. Finally, please join the conversation on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash truthquest podcast. Well, my intent for the TruthQuest podcast is to produce content that is evergreen, meaning the content is just as relevant to someone listening to an episode today, tomorrow, next month, next year, or 10 years down the road. I also try to produce content that is relevant to the current news cycle. Since the election of Donald Trump, tariffs have been a big topic of discussion. He has renegotiated NAFTA, butted heads with the Canadian Prime Minister, and in recent days, China has been huffing and puffing about tariffs imposed by the United States. So I thought it was time to publish this episode. Before we dive into the meat and potatoes of this episode, I want to warn you ahead of time that when you're evaluating the arguments against tariffs, you will need to be prepared to tap into that counterintuitive part of your brain. Folks tend to only go an inch deep on issues like this, making them easy prey for politicians and them to look beyond the rhetoric and the immediate results. As we did with the previous episode, The Truth About Nullification, let's start with a definition of the topic at hand, tariffs. Thomas Sowell defines it this way, Tariffs are taxes on imports which serve to raise the prices of those imports, and thus enable domestic producers to charge higher prices for competing products than they could in the face of cheaper foreign competition. So, we impose tariffs on something like sugar or steel, both discussed later, that raises the price on the foreign good to a level higher than they would be without the tariff. So as you know, one of the ideas I try to convey throughout the TruthQuest episodes is the importance of questions, especially when you find yourself in a debate with somebody. This tactic will play a big part in today's episode as well. It's important for you to remember that you do not have to have all the answers in order to engage a debate partner. You can appear agnostic and simply ask lots of questions within his or her position. In episode number four, The Truth About Abortion, I posed the question, what about the baby, as the cornerstone of any conversation about the topic. Regardless of what excuse or argument a pro-abortion advocate makes for their position, you simply ask them, what about the baby? In episode seven, The Truth About Climate Change, the question we posed was, what about all the lies and data manipulation? How can you be an advocate for economy-killing measures if the information you are operating on is likely false? In episode 12, The Truth About Socialized Medicine, the inherent questions were, what about the rationing of care, long wait times, and lack of accountability? Again, how can you be in favor of such a system if you know it will have such a detr detrimental impact on health care? And finally, in episode 14, The Truth About Obamacare, the question was, well, what about the repeated lies told by the Democrats and President Obama? What about the constitutionality of the law? Here again, why support a policy built on lies? Why support an unconstitutional law? So today's question is, what about the consumer? Think about that as we walk through this episode. What is the impact of the proposed tariff on the consumer of the end product? As another way of explaining tariffs, I'm going to use one of my favorite columnists, Daniel Mitchell, who ripped apart a recent uh, tariff-related tweet by President Trump. He dismantled it phrase by phrase in a manner that teaches economics. Trump tweeted, I am a tariff man. When people or countries come in to raid the great wealth of our nation, I want them to pay for the privilege of doing so. It will always be the best way to max out our economic power. We are right now taking in billions in tariffs. Make America rich again. All right, so phrase one, when people or countries come in to raid the great wealth of our nation. Mitchell explains, trade is based on voluntary exchange. The only raid is when politicians impose taxes on those exchanges things that we want to buy. Denying consumers the benefits of being able to buy what they want at the lowest price available. My two cents is, 
How is selling us, the consumer, cheaper goods a raid on wealth? It actually leaves us with more money in our pocket. Phrase two, I want them to pay for the privilege of doing so. Mitchell said, why should anyone have to pay for their privilege of a mutually beneficial exchange? In other words, you and I benefit from the cheaper products and the foreign seller benefits from the sale of the products. We are both privileged to participate in the transaction. Phase three, it will always be the best way to max out our economic power. Mitchell counters, trade taxes are a way to max out the power of politicians, not the economic power of America. And I would add, what about the consumer? Tariffs max out the power of the protected industries, not the consumer or the broader economy. And finally, phrase four, we are right now taking in, bil taking in billions in tariffs. Mitchell explains, the government is imposing billions in taxes. The American people are the ones paying. Again, I would say, what about the consumers, Mr. President? So what happens to the price of a good in which a tariff is imposed? If you answered it goes up, you are correct. So who pays the inflated price? If you said the foreign manufacturer, you would be wrong. If you said the foreign government, you would be wrong. If you answered the domestic consumer, you are correct. You and I pay more for whatever item has a tariff imposed on it. So the billions in tariffs that Trump is excitedly citing in his tweet comes from who? If you said you and me, the consumers, you would be correct. Those of you who have listened to this podcast know that often I, the first question I ask is, what does the Constitution say about the topic at hand? Well, interestingly enough, despite Trump's tweeting over tariffs, they are not the purview of the executive branch. Despite Trump's tweeting over tariffs, they are not the purview of the executive branch. It is invested with Congress. See Article 1, Section 8. Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excise, etc., etc. As with much that ails America, the blame for executive overreach in this arena and many others is the abdication by Congress of their constitutional duty. Just like with the War Powers Act, they do not want to be on the record, so they let the executive branch make decisions beyond their constitutional powers, allowing Congress to sit back and criticize. When you study the history of tariffs in the United States, you can't help but come across the mention of how well tariffs worked during the first 150 years of the nation's history. Tariffs were essentially the only source of funding of the new federal government during the founding generations. So tariffs must not be too bad then, right? That's how the argument goes, anyways. Unfortunately, no. See, back then, there was an across-the-board tariff on all imported goods. Tariff on all imported goods. The list was not cherry-picked across favored industries by pandering politicians. Additionally, the federal government was small. The dollar was on a gold standard, and there was no income tax, no corporate tax, no payroll tax, no death tax, or capital gains tax. So maybe if we got rid of the unconstitutional income tax and all the other taxes and revert back to a tariffs, across-the-board tariffs, and maybe a consumption tax, most people would not have a problem with it. Unfortunately, with the implementation of the income tax in 1913, tariffs went from being a revenue source for the relatively small federal government to the tool of cronyism that it is today. In an article in Reason magazine, Eric Bohm wrote, After the ratification of the Constitution, the very first law passed by the new Congress was the Tariff Act of 1789. It imposed an 8% tax on pretty much all imports into the United States, with the revenue from the tariffs used to fund the new national government and to pay down debts accumulated. The early tariffs did solve a very practical revenue problem for the early United States government. In these, those days, before H&R Block, indeed before income taxes, collecting taxes was a difficult prospect. It was much easier to post up custom officials at every port and collect taxes on the physical stuff that came ashore than to send tax collectors to every town and borough across 13 states to collect taxes from the populace, especially since many of those would-be taxpayers weren't entirely sold on the idea of a powerful central government and had recent history of armed rebellion against excessive taxation. If Trump wants to make the argument that America should use taxes, tariffs, to raise revenue, like we did in the 1790s, he better have a plan to abolish all federal taxes on income, investments, and labor. If he wants to have the discussion, well, I'll listen. Brian Dimitrick wrote the following in a Forbes article about the history of tariffs in America. When the American economy really boomed under the tariff over the first half of our history, financiers and entrepreneurs plowed money, energy, and plowed money, energy, and ideas into businesses, knowing that all receipts were available to recover costs and to make a profit. 
So think about that. Business owners were able to plow everything they made right back into their businesses. No trips to their accountants, no income taxes, no payroll taxes to withhold, no, no business expenses to be documented and claimed. As Daniel Mitchell said to conclude one of his many articles on tariffs, the moral of today's story is that tariffs are bad, but they are less bad than the modern welfare administrative state. So before we tackle the fallacies of the pro-tariff camp, let's circle back to the question of the day. What about the consumer? Do you see how tariffs benefit the few at the expense of many? Isn't it a good thing to be able to buy stuff for less money? So what about the high wage fallacy? This fallacy goes something like this. American goods cannot compete with goods produced by low wage workers in poorer countries. Dispensing of this fallacy where we were earlier. After all, this argument seems to make logical sense. We hear all the time about workers in Vietnam working for $2 a day to make Nike shoes or factories in China that employ thousands of low wage workers making all kinds of products that grace with the Walmart shelves. How can a high-wage country like the United States compete? As Thomas Sowell explains, this is a fallacy basically because the thinking is shallow. You must consider the entire cost of making a product, not just the wage rates. You have to consider the unit cost. You have to consider productivity. Typically, you will get better productivity in high-wage countries. Better technology, better machinery, better management, less costly transportation costs makes the total cost of delivering a product to market less. Workers in high-wage countries produce more product than their low-wage peers in these poor countries. If Vietnam can produce shoes less expensively than U.S. workers, then that is something to be celebrated. They have a comparative advantage in that area. Comparative advantage simply means countries produce what they can produce the cheapest. The consumers always benefit when we buy cheaper stuff. As Brian Kaplan at fee.org wrote, when Americans trade with foreigners, we're better off, and so are they. The savings we gain from buying cheaper imported goods are available to spend at American companies that have a competitive advantage in whatever their industry is. Murray Rothbard put it this way, We are not, if we were ever, a world of self-sufficient farmers. The market economy is one vast lattice work throughout the world in which each individual, each region, each country produces what he or it is best at, most relatively efficient in, and exchanges that product for the goods and services of others. So yes, shoe producers in the United States will lose their jobs. But that can be celebrated too as those workers move into jobs in which the U.S. has a competitive advantage. The workforce as a whole is more productive. Unfortunately, politicians play on the electorate's emotions and economic Unfortunately, politicians play on the electorate's emotions and economic ignorance with talk of job loss caused by these nasty foreigners. So let's tackle the claim that terrorists will save jobs. When it comes to this topic, you have to ask yourself, why would our elected officials want to purposely subject his constituents to incur higher costs? They argue that when other countries levy tariffs on our goods, it kills domestic jobs because fewer American-made goods are sold abroad because they are too expensive. This is Trump's position. And while that statement may be true, and it certainly makes the argument for retaliatory tariffs easier to sell, is that the whole story? So assuming tariffs actually do save jobs, is it really worth it to make millions of people spend more on their purchases in order to save jobs in a particular industry? Let's just say it. Tariffs are about pandering to special interests. The government imposes artificial protections from foreign competition. Why can't the industry compete rather than cheat? And are we really going to argument that these displaced workers cannot find another job? Henry Hazlitt taught us that the study of the economic impact of any policy must look beyond the immediate effects and to the long-term effects on the whole community. In the case of tariffs, we must consider the benefits going to the special interest group while the long-term impact hits the broader economy. In his book, Economics in One Lesson, in his book, Economics in One Lesson, Hazlitt uses an example of a sweater manufacturer who can sell sweaters at $15. There is a $5 tariff on all imported sweaters because British sweater makers are able to sell the same garment for $10. So now they are on equal footing, selling at $15. So what if the tariff was removed? The immediate effects are all the things you hear in mainstream outlets. The resulting unemployment on the sweater manufacturer, the devastation to a town who loses its largest employer, and all the fallout from that. Home foreclosures, all the businesses that the workers patronize, get take a hit, etc. Get take a hit, etc. Let's consider the long-term effects on the broader economy, which are rarely discussed in mainstream circles. 
Let's ask the question of the day. What about the consumer? Hundreds of thousands of consumers can now buy sweaters for $10 instead of $15. They now have $5 more in their pocket. What do they do with it? Save it? Spend it? Invest it? Any way you slice it, it bolsters the broader economy. Savings in a bank get loaned out to people buying large items or to a business who employ people. Spending the leftover money elsewhere obviously boosts the businesses in which they patronize. Don't forget to factor in the multiplier effect. 100,000 or a million people with five extra dollars in their pocket. That's a lot of money available to boost the broader economy. Or is it better to force those dollars into a product with a protective tariff and supposedly save 5,000 jobs in some particular industry? Let's take it a step further. We buy foreign-made sweaters in dollars. The foreign manufacturer now has U.S. dollars in which they can buy American goods here. Because we have permitted this foreign manufacturer to sell more in the States, they make use of the dollars by buying more from us. Both our imports and exports rise. So yes, fewer people are employed making sweaters in the U.S. On balance, more people are employed across the broader economy in order to service the foreigner buying American stuff. As Hazlitt says, the employment on net balance has not gone down, but America and foreign production on net balance has gone up. Labor in each country is more fully employed than doing just those things that does best, instead of being forced to do things that it does inefficiently or badly. Consumers in both countries are better off. They are able to buy what they want where they can get it the cheapest. Fact. You cannot increase employment by restricting trade. You may argue, well, we just need to maintain employment by using tariffs. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen either. Steel because of the lack of international competition. That meant that everything made of steel costs more than it should. On the one hand, a study found that the steel companies earned $240 million more in additional profits due to the tariffs, and 5,000 jobs were saved. Well, isn't that wonderful? On the other hand, American industries using steel lost an estimated $600 million in profits, and 26,000 jobs were lost. There were some 170,000 workers in the steel industry, but some 7 million workers in industries using steel. So the special interest, the steel industry, won at the expense of everyone else. As I mentioned a minute ago, there is a multiplier effect when it comes to tariffs, so-called savings of jobs. The first example was on the plus side for the broader economy in a free trade, no tariff environment. What happens when you raise the cost of something? Not only are you sucking money out of the economy via the, via the higher prices, but you, are, you must also consider the impact on industries that use the tariff's product. The downstream impact multiplies the effect of the tariff. Steel, sugar, Canadian softwood, auto parts. You may claim to save jobs in one industry, but the cost to the broader economy and the industries that rely on the saved industry's product take a hit. The current response to any industry looking for protectionist tariffs is suck it up, buttercup. Figure out how to compete or go do something else with your life. George Bush's steel tariff on Chinese steel was an attempt to save a portion of those 170,000 jobs. It ended up costing somewhere in the neighborhood of 200,000 steel-related jobs and $4 billion in economic activity. So the economy as a whole lost more jobs than there were workers in the steel industry. A more recent example of the downstream impact of protective tariffs is Harley-Davidson. It involved steel and aluminum tariffs, which of course are inputs to the production of motorcycles. Which of course are inputs to the production of motorcycles. Those costs went up as a result of the tariffs, and then Harley-Davidson got hit with retaliatory tariffs by other countries, some of whom put direct tariffs on Harley-Davidson motorcycles. So what does Harley-Davidson do? It shifts some manufacturing outside of the United States to avoid EU tariffs on American-made Harley-Davidson motorcycles. What happened? Trump bashed them. If Trump is trying to force the hands of other countries, he should tell Americans and some American businesses that there is going to be some short-term pain that we need to endure as the trade war works its way out. But bashing a company for trying to preserve their business and their jobs is immature to say the least. One more example is the restriction on sugar imports in the United States. They have no doubt saved a few jobs in the sugar industry, but at what cost? The artificially high price of sugar that must be paid by, drumroll please, the consumer, and in this case, that industry has lost jobs because of the lower sales caused by the artificially higher prices of their in primary input, sugar. 
Some companies moved their production facilities to Canada and Mexico in order to get the cheaper sugar. Question for skeptics. Is it worth saving one industry at the expense of others with many more people impacted? Remember the multiplier effect. If there are 50,000 workers in the sugar industry, how many million work in industries that use sugar that are adversely impacted by the tariffs? Why don't we ever have these conversations? Why doesn't anyone ask Trump this question? One final example that many of you are, have likely heard of is the Smoot-Hawley tariffs in of 1930. Most historians place much of the blame on the Great Depression on these tariffs. They were designed to reduce imports so more American-made products would be sold, and as the theory went, would increase employment. Based on what we've already said here, what do you think happened? Yep, you guessed it. Other countries, what do you think happened? Yep, you guessed it. Other countries imposed retaliatory tariffs, and unemployment exploded worldwide. Hmm, couldn't see that coming, could you? Well, what about dumping? Well, dumping occurs when goods are placed on the international market at, at artificially low prices in order to corner the market. The idea being that once they put domestic producers out of business, they will have cornered the market and have a monopoly. The Chinese have dumped steel and aluminum in Canada and Mexico for many years. The Chinese government actually subsidizes these industries. They sell it at a loss. Many argue that they are purposely destroying our steel and aluminum industries, industries we need for military purposes. It's economic warfare, they say. So this may be an instance where retaliatory tariffs by the U.S. are warranted. However, let's have that conversation and stop with the pandering, emotional language about lost jobs. Question of the day, what about the consumer works well when it comes to the dumping discussion? We automatically take the side of the domestic producers at the expense of the domestic consumers who benefit from the lower price of the dumped products. So what do we know about tariffs? Murray Rothbard summed them up nicely when he said, protectionism is simply a plea that consumers, as well as the general prosperity, be hurt so as to confer permanent special privilege upon groups of inefficient producers at the expense of competent firms and of consumers. We know that tariffs are nothing more than a tax on the domestic consumer. We know that there is a multiplier effect associated with tariffs, also known as the Walmart effect. When we spend less on imported goods, that leaves millions of consumers with so-called extra money in their pocket to spend, save, and or invest elsewhere in the broader economy. And vice versa, if they are paying artificially inflated prices, they have less money. We know that restricting trade does not increase employment. As a matter of fact, it usually results in the loss of jobs in the non-industries. We know that the argument that high-wage countries cannot compete with low-wage countries is not as simple as politicians make it out to be. We know that free trade is the best way for us, the consumer, because we get stuff at cheaper prices. Pandering to special interests hurts the broader economy. Honestly, folks, we should have zero tariffs so the stuff we get is cheaper. I get it that other countries are slapping tariffs on some of our industries. I get it that retaliatory tariffs are necessary in order to end those tariffs. What I am opposed to is the shallowness of our politicians' arguments for tariffs. They only discuss the immediate re results, never speaking straight to the American people, explaining to us what a tariff will mean to our pocketbooks. We may save a few jobs here and there, but prices are going to rise over here and over there, which will likely lead to loss of jobs over there and over there. In the end, tariffs are not good economics. They are good politics, as Peter Schiff is fond of saying. When you think about it, when foreign countries slap tariffs on our goods, the same economic dynamics, the same economic dynamics are at work over there. They are forcing their citizens to spend more money on those goods domestically. It hurts their broader economy. You may have heard the expression, where there is trade, there is no war. Most wars are not fought between trading partners. That is something our representatives should take seriously. I will leave you with one final counterintuitive thought. Shouldn't companies that are unable to compete with foreign competitors for whatever reason be allowed to fail? Haven't we already had this too-big-to-fail argument? Allow those workers to find jobs in a more competitive industry. You don't protect the few at the expense of many. Please join the conversation on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash truthquestpodcast.